What is good, NIMFAM? Welcome back to the FPI eye test with Villa on the absolute rampage and wild cards galore. Who should we look out for? We'll also take a little look at my points in this video and my early transfer thoughts. So let's get into the eye test for game week eight. So Aston Villa are on the up, smashing Brighton 6-1 in game week seven. Villa were purring, but it's Watkins that really wowed. He's now scored four in a row against Brighton. He's just on it at the moment. Should that second goal stood though is a question only officials and most of Twitter can answer. <laughs> but it didn't matter in the end. Let's be honest, Villa were by far the better team. And Watkins was the star man. He had a hat-trick and two assists and now that's four goals and six assists for this season, putting him above Haaland four points in FPL with 54 making him the top scoring forward in the game currently. Would you have ever believed that at the start of the season? If you are wildcarding this week, then Oli has to be in your team, or at least you need to leave a way to get to him should you want to take a punt elsewhere and say an Alvarez for a couple more game weeks. Leave a bit of budget in your bank to get to Ollie Watkins if you don't go with him this week. Mentions also have to go to Diaby who has got two assists and there's some different quotes going around about his injury at the moment so if you are investing in him or you are on a wild card just make sure that he's good before doubling down on that transfer. Cash got his assist. Those that joined me on my lock-in stream on Friday will know how close I came to getting him in this week and now he's had the double rise. I'm not going to be able to afford him unless I wildcard or take Saliba out. Hmm, that's difficult. And lastly, Douglas Louise, if you're looking for a budget differential, he has three goals for the season now. Maybe one to consider for your watch list. Villa now have 10 straight league wins at home. Next time they are at home is in game week nine against West Ham. Whilst we're here talking about Brighton and Villa, we have to have a quick chat about Brighton. They really struggled. And so did I as an Astupanan owner. Now, before I completely lay into the stupid man, he did start reasonably well. He could have had a goal at the start. And if he hadn't have gone off at half time, we would have had minus four points instead of minus two. So, you know, every cloud and all that. But to be honest, that's where the positives finished. If you can even call them positives, unfortunately. He was getting turned around, turned over, left, right and centre. He looked lost. He didn't know what to do with himself. He had no clue. And this is not great with Lamptey waiting in the wings. What I will say is that Lamptey didn't fare much better when he came on. However, he was definitely better than what Stupinam was. But... There's competition in that position now and De Zibri will not be afraid to switch things up when things are going badly. What that means for Estupanan owners, I may have already sold him is all I can say on that. Brighton have now gone 11 consecutive games without a clean sheet and I would rather hop off of Estupanan and wait for them to find their rhythm again rather than leaking points most weeks. That's where I'm coming from anyway. I have to give a mention to Sonny in this video. He was mentioned in our Hot or Not video last game week and he did not disappoint again this game week. Ange played Sonny up top again and had Richarlison on the left. This seems to really, really work for Sonny. He's becoming a bit of a tapping merchant. He reminds me a little bit of Kane's role when he was at Spurs. I don't know if Sonny's picked a, a lot of that up around Kane, but it's definitely working for him, as I say. Sonny now has six goals this season, averaging 7.3 points per match. With Luton, Fulham and Palace up next, he feels like a big bandwagon to have. Now, it does very much depend on what Fulham and Palace turn up, of course, because they can be tough teams on their day, let's be honest. But I think Spurs maybe have a little edge on these teams at the moment and you know me I love a mixture of form and fixtures he did go off early I think that's just Ange managing this knock that he seems to have picked up I don't think it's much to worry about but one maybe just to keep an eye on moving on and one thing you might be wondering if you own Saka or are considering selling or keeping Saka on your wild card is who is the penalty taker at Arsenal well as an Arsenal fan First of all, I just want to say on the eye test, Saka looked great at the start of that match. He tucked away his first goal brilliantly. He was involved in every attacking threat. But 
he did give away two of his penalties, which I know has upset a lot of FPL managers. The first one he gave away to Odegaard, and the second one he gave away to Kai Havertz. I heard some people asking, is this because he has a bit of an injury, a bit of a knock, and he didn't want to risk it just in case? But I think the answer probably lays much more in what Rice said in his post-match interview. Rice said when asked about Saka giving away the penalty to Havertz, he said that I know at other teams there is a specific penalty taking, suggesting at Arsenal that there isn't. Now, do I think that Saka is the number one penalty taker? Yes, I do. But everything that Arteta is trying to build is centred around this team mentality, spreading the love around. Think of it as a bit Ted Lasso if you must. I think that Odegaard took the first penalty because the game was still in the balance. Saka wanted to get that goal on the score sheet and he can trust Odegaard to do that. But with a buffer in the bank, giving the chance to Havertz was building his spirits and confidence for the team. That simply means that whilst we'll see Saka on penalties again, he'll not be shy about passing them around to his teammates if it's best for the team something to think about with your ownership. Just a little mention though, while we're here, it's great to see Jesus and Odegaard back in the points again, so worth keeping an eye out with Arsenal's fixtures about to turn in a couple of game weeks time. If you'd like to know more about my points and early transfer plans, then I'll be coming at you little munchkins in just a moment, so hold tight on that one. But not before I talk about the Bowen bounce. If Suchek had finished his dinner from Bowen's pass, and if not for the keeper stopping a bullet header from Gerrard, then Bowen could have had a lot more than his one goal on the weekend. He did take that one goal beautifully though. He now has five goals and one assist for this season, placing him third for midfielder points with 48 only behind Saka and Son. Everything is going through Bowen and West Ham have some tasty fixtures coming up, especially from game week 10. But I wouldn't put it past Bowen to nickel or something. Him or James Ward-Prowse, if you aren't considering one of those now, definitely think about it in the coming game weeks for sure they both look great and if you are looking for help with your fpl team please check the sponsors of this video fancyfootballfix.com where you can follow the world's best fpl managers team reveals live link is in the description below before we get stuck into my points i have a differential that i'd like to mention i almost put him in last week's video and i'm annoyed at myself that i didn't with wolves terrible start to the season there is one man that might be going under the radar and it's pedro neto he seems to be making the play for wolves when many others aren't. A lot of the attacking threat seems to be of his making. We talk about players being the talisman for their teams, Neto looks that for Wolves. He was the reason Wolves scored against City, Wolves had 32% possession to City's 68% possession and they only had three attempts and yet they defied the odds and scored that goal. Neto's goal against Luton may have been his first in months, but every game week I can't help but notice, especially on the eye test, how lively he's been. With five assists now to his name, he's just 5.6 million and with many looking to add, say, Salah, Son, Haaland, Trippier potentially, or more, potentially even with Watkins at top. Could he be a cheap enabler for your team, especially if you're on a wild card? He's a definite add to the watch list, if nothing else, as he's returned in every game week except game week one. And his fixtures are now starting to look a little tastier in the near future, too. Right, with all of that, let's get on to my team and my possible transfers. Turner got me three points. Not bad considering, but I was hoping for a clean sheet if Mbwemo wasn't going to score. I got this one wrong, I'll be completely honest. I benched Johnson after the midweek fixture with him losing to United. I was really concerned for him, but I shouldn't have been. He's now sat staring at me on my bench with nine points. Typical. In defence, ugh. Gosh, I'd just rather not talk about this if I'm honest, as Stupinan may or may not already have been sold in my team. More on that in just a moment. But I only bought Botman last week and he's already injured. What fresh hell is this? <laughs> Luckily, I'm getting sleepers points off of the bench for him, especially as I kind of flip-flop between changing him and a Stupinan out several times. And I was chaffed with Kabore's two points until he got a yellow card down to one point. 
now I kind of need something absolutely magical from him on Tuesday evening. In midfield, it didn't get much better. A sea of twos and Saka with his goal and Buemo blanked again. The main problem with me holding this wild card at the moment is that I may have to keep Mbwemo for some weeks yet if I want to do Alvarez to walk in soon, which I think I'm likely going to want to. So this is really tough because Mbwemo just really has dropped off of a cliff. Up front, Haaland was quiet. A good time to have gone against the captaincy if you did so. But where Haaland failed, Alvarez helped pull me up a little bit with his eight points from his goal. That means I'm currently on 37 points when my six points come in off of the bench. And that's a red arrow to 2.3 million. I do have Gabora yet to play again, but hey, not really expecting very much. It isn't great, but somehow I'm still clinging on to not using my wildcard if I can help it. However, that doesn't mean that I haven't made any transfers yet. I have gone a bit bat shizzle. And I have jumped early. I have already done Rashford to Salah. And I didn't enjoy doing this because as you guys will know, I was really trying to hold my patience with Rashford. Really feeling like he may come good. But I just ran out of time on the budget front. I'll be completely honest with you guys. The way the prices are this season, it was either get off now or lose so much money on him that I would not be able to afford other players in the future. So I'm kind of hoping by taking this minus four now that I'll be able to hold my wild card and then potentially get Rashford back in if he becomes an option again. But yeah, as you know, I've very much been kind of trying to protect Rashford in this team for a while and it just hasn't paid off. I hold my hands up. I thought United may come good and they just haven't yet. That's not to say that they won't but for the moment I have to get off and protect myself and then consider getting back on later down the line. My second transfer was Saka to Sun. Now I hated this one even more than the Rashford selling. I really do not like selling Saka he has been brilliant I mean you only have to look where he is in the points tally to know that Saka is doing well do I feel that he's injured now look I, I don't know is the honest answer I don't think so this was a bit of a theme last season where he'd get knocked about a bit he'd come off early we'd think he wasn't going to play the next game week and then he did so I've not sold Saka in the thinking that he's injured and he won't play next week I do feel he will play against Man City that's half the reason I think why he was taken off early I also really do think that Saka could do very very well against City City's defence at the moment seems a bit of a nightmare so I think and I hope that Arsenal will do very very well against City I have disliked doing this However, I had to weigh up whether I thought Sun would do better over, say, the next three than maybe what Saka would do. And with that in mind, I decided that I would take the punt on it. And I think that's because I know I still have the wild card in my back pocket. I know I can always go back to Saka if I need to. But Arsenal's fixtures from about game week 10, 9, 10, they start to look tasty again. So I'm feeling like it's a kind of trying to think of it as a bit of a hop on hop off situation off now for a few game weeks back on in a couple of game weeks there's every possibility with the injury that Saka could drop in price this week maybe even next week depending on how well he does at City so this is a punt look I, I am in the million club at the moment I don't have very much to lose I, I mean I, I hated selling Saka because he's my boy but I needed to take a bit of a punt and Sun is just on form at the moment so I've dived for it this meant that I had to take a minus four because I was 0.2 off of just getting Sun and Salah in for Rashford and Saka so I downgraded a Stupanan, who of course could hurt in any given week. However, now with Brighton looking a bit iffy in defence, very roller coaster, great some weeks, terrible in others, and Lamptey waiting in the wings just to take a Stupanan's place at any given moment, I decided it was probably worth it. And I've taken a bit of a punt on Burn. Again, I don't feel like Burn's place is nailed. I would have loved cash here, but I wasn't able to afford it, unfortunately. Just to sum all of that up, I have taken a minus four. I took it on Saturday evening, which is completely back chisel. 
don't do it kids, it's not sensible and I now have to wait the whole week to see what's going to happen. If any of these players that I have transferred in pick up an injury or if any of the players in my team already existing get an injury then I am likely to have to hit the wildcard button unless I'm going to take a minus eight. So I would stick with me, folks, because this could be an interesting ride this week. But for now, that is it. Thank you all so much for watching. Please don't forget to like and subscribe and join the NIM fam. I am on the road to 10K, so you'd be really helping me out if you could hit that sub button. Do keep your eyes open on this channel for more videos coming this week. Until next time, Nymphria out.